Santa Cruz, mate bien, rate la exeia, quilar, a mi mate, a tu naroma, mosuma. It seems we are ready to begin. We have all our speakers here uh, this um, evening, morning, wherever you may be. So um, let's get underway, I suggest. I trust you're all able to hear my voice loud and clear, that it's yeah. um, good quality audio. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, we have uh, many people joining us from across different time zones. And so I'd like to say welcome. Benvindo, ba maluk sirahotu, iha Dili, Australia, Portugal, Brazil, no fatin seluk seluk tan, haunia naran, Vanessa Hierman, benvindo, ba loron rua, itania simposio, konaba masakre Santa Cruz nian. Itahahu ohin ho se saun idane kualia konaba livro fung nebe membro TLSA nian makakerek no publica. Ita fo para bench ba itania kolega, autor, no editor sira nebe publica sira nia livro i hatinan idane kotinan kotuk. Diskusaun tu irmai ita say hello i halian ingles. Obrigado wain. So welcome to day two of our symposium, everybody. We start today by celebrating and discussing a few newly published books and conference proceedings on Timor-Leste on Timor -Leste by TLSA members. My name is Vanessa Hierman. I'll be chairing this session and I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wajuk Nyunga people in the area of Perth in Western Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners there and their uh, elders, both past, present and emerging. But first, before we go on with our book discussion, we have a very special launch of the TLSA conference proceedings from last year's conference hosted by our colleagues in Portugal. It was the first fully online conference of the TLSA and we acknowledge the hard work of the conference organisers in treading into what was then uncharted waters. The conference was a wonderful gathering in what was a terrible pandemic year. We thank them for bringing us together in the late night, early morning collegial sessions in what had been for many of us a strangely isolated and worrisome time. Thank you to TLSAPT for reconnecting us across the world again. We have some of the editors here of the TLSAPT conference proceedings, and I would really like to acknowledge their hard work and contributions uh, from TLSAPT. We have Rui Feijo, Zelia Pereira, Lucio Souza, Luisa Coutinho, Vicente Paulino, and Marisa Gonçalves as editors. And then there are also um, some of us who played a less significant role of editing various of the single volumes, uh, such as David Webster, uh, Hannah Loney, myself, and, and Marisa also edited some of the smaller volumes, uh, the individual volumes, uh, not the overarching uh, proceedings as a whole. So I want to hand over now to our colleagues, uh, to Hui and Zelia and other colleagues to just spend a few minutes uh, taking us through this exciting multi-volume publication, which will soon be out online and also, I presume, in hard copy in several volumes as well. So I'd like to now invite the editors of the proceedings to um, tell us a little bit about the process and what we've got to look forward to in terms of the proceedings. So over to you guys. Thank you very much. Sorry. 
Would you like us to um, take up the three, just the, the discussion about the three books and then we can come back? Yes, if you don't mind. I'm sorry about this. I'm not really no, these things happen. seeing what, what's happening. Okay, please go ahead. I'll, I'll try to reconnect. Yep, okay. Let's just... Um... All right, so um, while we pause on the, um, the launch of the TLSA conference proceedings, we'll flip that now and we'll have that uh, towards the end uh, of our proceedings and we'll go on with our book discussion uh, now, I think. Um, so if our three authors are ready, I'm just going to introduce each one of you uh, first and then I'll ask you to uh, uh, consider certain uh, comments and questions about um, a little bit about your book that we so if you could talk a bit about your book that would be fabulous but first I'll just introduce um, each of our authors first our authors and editor so the first one is um, uh, I'd like to introduce is Dr Peter Job from the University of New South Wales and if I may claim you as well Peter from Curtin University. Peter will be doing a little bit of work with me as well on my research project. So um, I think we can double badge you as coming from both universities. And Peter is the author of A Narrative of Denial, Australia and the Indonesian Invasion of East Timor, published by Melbourne University Press 2021. And the book deals with the years under Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser in particular in Australia when the government cemented what became a bilateral policy on the annexation of East Timor. Next, we also have Associate Professor Lisa Palmer from the University of Melbourne. She is the author of Ireland Encounters Timor Leste from the Outside In, published also this year by the uh, Australian National University ePress. It's a fascinating book of travel, memoir, and anthropological observations. It's a very special book. And as well, last but not least, is Associate Professor Kelly Silva from the University of Brasilia, editor of the book, Performing Modernities, Pedagogies and Technologies in the Making of Contemporary Timor-Leste, an edited volume, a critical look at uh, the uh, unfolding of capitalism, modernity, and the construction of a market society in Timor-Leste today. So uh, with the format of this book talk, I've asked our authors uh, to speak for about 10 minutes each to tell us a bit about their books, what it was like to research and write the book, what were some of the challenges they encountered, and what they hope readers will get out of their books. So at this point, Perhaps uh, if Peter maybe could get us uh, started and to speak for a few minutes uh, before we ask Lisa and Kelly to please speak about their books. So uh, please everybody welcome Peter Job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, sorry, thank you, Vanessa, it's, um, for that introduction. The book is uh, called a Narrative of Denial, Australia and the Indonesian Violation of East Timor. It's based upon an extensive archival studies, mostly of documents from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and other agencies, so looking at a number of other documents as well, and also interviews with diplomats, politicians, activists, and a few other people in the period 1975 to 1983. Uh, I chose that period because that is um, the period in which most of the most serious violations during the occupation took place. It was uh, the period of uh, encirclement and annihilation by the Indonesian armed forces in which they created the artificial famine that drove many Timorese from their homes into um, resettlement uh, camps where many of them died. And uh, it, uh, this should be, I believe, studied as a period itself and our policy reaction. We're here in Australia, we were in a situation where a massive humanitarian catastrophe was occurring very close to our shores. Uh, astonishingly, there was very little 
uh, reaction to it, either from the Australian government or from the Australian community. Um, so why do I call it a, a narrative of denial? Well, first of all, I should say this was an account of, po of policy failure. Australian policy failed uh, in three basic ways. First of all, it fails to improve relations with Indonesia, which is what the Fraser government in particular and the Whitlam government before it sought out to do. In fact, the uh, Timor issue um, meant that there were ongoing tensions throughout the whole period of the occupation, some of which remain today. Secondly, it was a failure of trust where uh, the Australian government uh, propagated a lie, basically, or a group of lies, a false narrative about the situation in East Timor, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And finally, it was a, a, a failure of morality. Uh, they say academics shouldn't, shouldn't talk about morality, but I think the, the fundamentally that's what it came down to. Uh, it was a failure to recognize the legitimacy of Timorese aspirations for national independence and to failure to uh, recognize and respond to uh, this massive humanitarian catastrophe that was happening near our shores and facilitated by Australia itself in, in a number of ways. Why do I call it a narrative of denial? Well, basically, Australia was more, far more than a passive observer. There's a, an idea that's been perpetuated by many critics of Australian policy that Australia turned a blind eye. In fact, Australia did far more than turned a blind eye. Australia proactively intervened, first of all, to encourage the invasion to take place in the first place under the Whitlam government in a situation where I think I've, I demonstrated in the first chapter um, if Australia had not intervened in that way, they, the Indonesians probably would not have chosen to invade. And I haven't got time to go into it in detail, uh, but it is well documented in that first chapter. The first chapter is on the Whitlam government and they call it the Whitlam intervention because that was, was, it was a proactive intervention uh, in uh, the, the situation to actively encourage Indonesia to intervene. Secondly, under the six chapters that cover the Fraser government, which is the, the great majority of the book, although when I, I notice that when I'm asked about it, I'm continually asked mostly about the Whitlam government. Uh, one of the purposes was to demonstrate that the Fraser government was equally or perhaps more important in supporting this catastrophe during that time by uh, propagating a false narrative that, took, that contained three basic elements. The first one was, uh, a false narrative about the events leading to the invasion to make it appear that the invasion um, was something that Indonesia had to do, that it was inevitable. There was this instability in this territory uh, near it that Indonesia had not caused, but was a destabilizing force for Indonesia. And in fact, that was almost the opposite of the truth. It was a proactive intervention by Indonesian uh, security forces that destabilized East Timor caused and eventually uh, there was a, a clandestine military intervention of which went under the guise of a civil war, pretending to be a civil war when it was in fact an Indonesian intervention. And that caused uh, the stability that Indonesia used as a pretext for invasion. Secondly, uh, it was a denial of the catastrophe itself. And I go through quite a lot of detail in the different ways Australia denied it to the Australian people, but most importantly to the international community, including at the United Nations, um, including by lobbying on a country to country basis um, extensively, uh, claiming that there was nothing serious happening in East Timor, claiming that Indonesians were, were doing their best in a difficult situation, denying the level of abuses, denying the level um, of human catastrophe and loss of life. Thirdly, when information came to the public attention and to the world's attention, that in fact, there was a catastrophe occurring there, Australia worked very proactively to try and divert blame from the Indonesian invasion itself and the actions of the armed forces. Uh, they produced a narrative claiming that Indonesia had always been poor, that it had been destabilized by Timorese themselves, by uh, an irresponsible civil war and uh, de de declaring independence when they shouldn't have, and that Indonesia had not caused this catastrophe, but was simply trying to 
uh, come to terms with it. Well, in fact, the, the reality was the opposite. And as I'm sure you all know, Indonesia proactively destroyed agricultural resources in federally held, held areas and created this uh, artificial famine and catastrophe. Um, as I said, Australia campaigned very, very proactively in the international uh, arena, and that is what my book uh, sets out to demonstrate. Of course, Australia went more than did more than campaign. It uh, provided military aid right throughout this period. One of the discoveries I made in the archives was to confirm what many people suspected that Australian military aid was actually used in East Timor and before uh, they re recognized uh, de jure um, recognition of it being, being part of East Timor. Nomad aircraft were spotted on airfields, uh, on Kamara airfield near Dili, um, during the uh, period where operations were at their height. So they clearly did use Australian military aid. So one of the questions I, I was asked is, what do I hope that the readers learn from this book? Uh, East Timor is one, and what happened in it during the occupation is one of the key events in our region in living history. It is something for which we have to come to terms. Australia's proactive intervention both before the invasion and afterwards to protect the Sahato regime is a major part of world history and it's a major part of our history and it is something in which we, we have to come to terms. My hope is that there'll be a sufficient understanding eventually to produce uh, an apology to the Timorese people from the Australian government, hopefully along for rec with recompense. Now this might, sound like a far-fetched thing to hope for, but remember anyone who's campaigned for an independent East Timor in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s will know you could never say anything is impossible. That's what I hope it might eventually lead to. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the reception of my book and how it's been received in various quarters. I expected people from the Department of Foreign Affairs, former diplomats, to be somewhat hostile to it, because I'm very critical, of course, of the Department of Foreign Affairs. I have been surprised that a, a number of diplomats have uh, actually, former diplomats, have written very positive reviews. One of them was uh, Ken Ward. He was a senior analyst at the Office of National Assessments for many years, worked for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for over 20 years, and he wrote a very quite a good positive review about it for Australian book review. Richard Bronowski was a former ambassador to Mexico and the Philippines. He just recently, about a month ago, wrote a positive review about it in Australian Outlook. I've, I've spoken to both of these people individually, um, and they are also very critical of Australian policy and supportive of what I write. Interestingly, my, the main uh, um, negative feedback I've got isn't from former diplomats, it is from former journalists who worked in Indonesia during this period. And guess what? They are the people who I criticize in this book for perpetuating this very narrative. And they've demonstrated to me that the narrative is not dead. Uh, a bloke called Don Greenlees, who some of you may have heard of, he's, he's um, responsible for a book of, of himself about the uh, independent intervention, um, basically responded to my book uh, with a review in, in Australian foreign policy, uh, describing, uh, bringing up all the old tropes that Australia did not uh, actively intervene, Australia didn't know what's happening. Um, it was Portuguese, Portugal's fault, not Australia's, and I don't criticize uh, the Portuguese. Uh, Whitlam didn't in fact want, uh, he said that it, there should be a proper, proper process of determination. Um, this is not really surprising because, of course, the fourth estate, the, the, the media failed extensively right throughout the period of occupation, but particularly during this period to demonstrate that this catastrophe was taking place. They were an active part of this narrative of denial. Um, I'm quite pleased with the book generally. If I were going to change anything, I think I'd write a little bit more about the role of the media and how that active a role that they played. Okay, so I think that's, uh, I've dropped, I've dropped, I see I've got a little bit over time. Sorry for that, but uh, thank you. No problem.
Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. And congratulations once again on this fine book that you have written and uh, published this year. So our next author that I'd like to call on is Associate Professor Lisa Palmer from the University of Melbourne, who will tell us a little bit about her book, Ireland Encounters, Timor-Leste from the Outside In. So over to you, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And Lisa's going to share some uh, images from the book uh, as she's speaking. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I have to unmute before I share my screen. Now I'm going back to share my screen. <laughs> okay, uh, can you see that now, Vanessa? Yep, we can. Yep, great. All right, well, firstly, my thanks to you, Vanessa, and to the TLSA committee uh, for the opportunity to present in this event. And like Vanessa, I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional Indigenous owners of the Melbourne area, where I speak to you all tonight, and also to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Timorese people, particularly the Katuas, Berexera, from the island which I write about in my book. I'd also, given the the um, theme of this conference, pay my respects to the victims and families of those affected by the Santa Cruz massacre and acknowledge the history changing contributions of Max Starr and the ongoing work of his value, invaluable audiovisual archive. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about Island Encounters, um, the book you can see on screen here. It's part travelogue, part memoir and part accessible academic analysis. It's a narrative, as you could guess from the uh, subtitle of Timor shaped by a journey from the outside in. Like the weaving of a cloth or taish, this book is a story told by the threading together of the warp and the wep weft. And uh, the lengthwise warp dwells in the experience of two decades of my involvement with Timor-Leste and more particularly the months I spent traveling with my family uh, including uh, my Timorese husband, Quintiliano Mock, from west to east across the island. And the crosswise weft is made up of stories and ideas that shuttle back and forth across the island to create the shared fabric of Timorese people's lives, or as, as I understand them through my encounters. So... Um, Hold on, I'm just trying to move on in my, there we go. There's the tash I should have shown you before. So as an anthropologist and geographer, I am trained to pay attention, listen, observe, and unpack the nuance and constant negotiation that make up people's lives. As I've come to know about the richly interconnected worlds of Timorese cultural and ecological communities, I've learned quite a bit about their life pathways. I've begun to see and more importantly feel the connections between people, their lands, waters, local histories, politics and customary practices. As I've investigated these connections as an academic, people often explicitly ask me to record and take their stories to those in power. I've come to realise that people do not share their stories without reason. They expect me to weave something new with their knots and threads, with the knots and threads of these stories. And as the cloth takes shape, so do my obligations to these people and all their varied aspirations. So I wrote my new book, Island Encounters, to reach a general rather than specifically academic audience. East Timor has a place in the hearts of many Australians and others connected to the country through its diaspora around the world. Those lucky enough to travel there, including every year I take a group of Australian university students, return captivated by its people, their land and their resilient spirit. In Island Encounters, I wanted to share my insights from two decades of experience with the country shining a light on the richly woven tapestry of Timorese lives and landscape. With an eye to the country's complex history and politics, my aim was to write an accessible book for a wider readership, tracing paths redolent in longing and learning, belonging and bewilderment, courage and conviction, 
to tell of an island divided by colonialism and conflict, but also joy and ongoing connection. I guess what impresses me most about Island Timor is the quiet determination of its people to maintain their relationships between their lands, waters, traditions, and each other. And I think this image illustrates that perfectly. This isn't an image from the book. It's an image that one of my husband's uh, nieces took a few months ago uh, as their uh, Umalulig Umalu complex is being rebuilt uh, in the village of Berkoli. This characteristic is shared broadly by most Timorese, this characteristic of an attachment to the lands, waters, traditions and each other, whether they be urban or rural dwellers. Although this is something we do not often hear about from the nation's modernizing capital and center of power, Dili. So I decided to write this book and share these encounters with an audience who might've had similar experiences or for whom all of this might be completely new. The process of writing the book uh, began really in my participation in a nocturnal wild honey harvest and community ritual with the Lok Yu community living right on the east and west Timor border. And a few of you here may have seen the film uh, that came out around this encounter in 2019. This border, which now delineates Timor-Leste and Indonesia, is also a relic of the Portuguese and Dutch colonisation and their centuries-long carving up of authority over the island created against the will and with the active resistance of the local Chetum speaking peoples, it is a border which continues to painfully divide families along with their ancestral lands and waters. The annual wild honey harvest in these borderlands are significant as a way of pushing back against this division, bringing together in celebration, people, bees and stories from both sides of the border. So during these nocturnal honey harvest ceremonies, men known as Laku will take on the persona of the Asian palm civet cat and climb tens of metres into the forest canopy, canopy with palm fibre fire sticks in pursuit of wild honey, bee larvae and wax, all the while singing poetic love songs to the bees. And here's some images of, of the uh, ritual offerings that are made to the bees during these harvests in the Laku community of the beautiful fire stick blooms uh, in the forest canopy at night um, as the bees uh, descend to the ground and the, the laku collect and harvest the honey. And the honey itself being prepared here at the forest altar um, where other offerings are made uh, to thank the bees for the, the gift of their honey. So this story, the story and the practices of the Lokyu honey harvest is just one of the deeply cultural stories and ideas that weaves and continually reweaves together the past, present and future of people's lives and landscapes across the island. These stories, practices and the encounters they engender connect not only the people, but also the languages, lands, waters, animals and plants that comprise this rich and varied landscape. These are re recurring stories across time and space that are suffused with ideas about the profound life organizing significance of insiders and outsiders, the mountains and the sea, the trunks and the tips, the darkness and the light, families and marriages, traditions and modernity. And here in this image, we have uh, a group of people from the Balkau hinterland who are carrying out a halot ruin or collecting the bones ceremony uh, to rebury to collect the bones of and bury family members that were killed in the early years of the Indonesian invasion. So the threads of these diverse preoccupations cultivate and nurture relationships, revealing layered interconnections between people and the lands and an astonishing depth of historical attentiveness. And uh, you'll find this documented in the various chapters of the book. So most Timorese people grow up learning that knowledge is partial, that your perspective depends on where you're from. They know too that rural Timorese norms and customs are different across the country. Sometimes they're even different in the same village. They know because they continually do it, that the truths about places and histories and cultures are worked out in the moment, in context and in constant negotiation with others. So in this book about my own partial and differently positioned encounters with people and place, in Island Timor, 
I hope that I do justice to some of these truths and encourage others to a greater appreciation of this richly woven, ever becoming world. The book, which is free to download from the ANU Press, is accompanied by two films associated with it. And I talked to you a little bit about Wild Honey, Caring for Bees in a Divided Land uh, already. That's one of the chapters in the book. And I have a new film that I've co-directed, Holding Tightly, Custom and Healing in Timor-Leste, uh, which is the broad subject matter of se several chapters in the latter half of the book. Um, and I'd just like to flag here that a virtual public screening of this film um, is scheduled for December 8th, uh, hosted uh, by Timor-Leste Studies Association. And I hope that many of you will join to see the film and for the Q&A with myself and my co-director, uh, Susanna Barnes, uh, because the film, as I said before, also is very much an accompaniment to the book. So I think I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to any questions later on. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Lisa. Next, I'd like to uh, call on Kelly Silva, who is joining us from uh, Brasilia, where it's uh, very early in the morning. We thank you very much uh, for your time. And of course, also congratulations once more to Lisa for her book and also to encourage everybody to come to the film screening. I also posted a copy of the PDF poster there in the chat. Encourage everyone to come along to that. So um, Kelly, do we have you yeah. online? Ready to go? Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Kelly. My pleasure. Over thank you very you. much. And apologize for my mistakes um, regarding the uh, conference. So thank you very much, Lucio, for solving the problem, the last minute problem. Uh, okay. Good. So, um, boa tarde, Maluxira. Cumprimentos do Brasil, Bae Marroto. Horas Neto, Colima da Dersan, Ré Brasil. Rao Matanducu Barak, então Raul sou licença a tu lê Raoni apresentação. Rao Hakarak Rató, Raoni agradecimento, no mos cumprimentos ba comitê organizador evento Idanê, no mos ba Timor Leste Studies Association comunidade. Obrigado Barak ba oportunidade a tu colher oito anos quando aba livro Performing Modernity. I'm afraid we lost her. Lost Kelly. Yes. Idea. She started freezing. Probably it's the web connection. Benefited from a series of Brazilian government grants from 2007, including a program founded by the Coordination of Higher Education Personal Improvement, which supported academic exchange between Universidade de Brasília and Universidade Nacional Timor-Lorosai between 2014 and 2018. Through this program, 11 Brazilian graduate and undergraduate students undertook field work in Timor-Leste, and five undergraduate uh, East Timorese students received training in social sciences research techniques at the University of Brasilia. This book brings some of the results of such efforts to a global audience. The way we devised the research agenda was not a priori in the sanitized spaces of laboratories. Negotiation took place in multiple arenas between diverse agents. In this process, East Timorese, uh, our East Timorese interlocutors' concerns and anxieties for improving the lives of their fellow people, whatever it might mean, have played an important role. How our interlocutors manage and made sense of the multiple complex and composite institutional settings in which they live is pivotal in the results in the in the resulting analysis. I turn now for some comments about what I expected the readers uh, come to learn by reading the book. I have selected four main points. They are the multiple phases of modernity and modernization in, in Timor-Leste, cultura and modernity in a post abyssal moment, performing modernities by means of new technologies and pedagogies, and last, 
continuity and change in the making of development. Now I, I, I have a small comments for each of these um, points. So the first one, uh, the multiple phases of modernity and modernization. Two ways of understanding modernity frame the research agenda developed in the book. The first is modernity as an analytical category, and the second, modernity as an emic and empirical idea. On the basis of such a perspective, discourses about and performances of modernity and modernization are the means by which people voice and build what they consider the um, the desider desirable and abject, good and bad, happy and sad, fair and unfair, reasonable and unreasonable, rational and irrational. In these uses, modernity is a floating signifier whose meaning is negotiated in each particular context. Now I turn for the second point, culture and modernity in a post-abyssal moment. Some chapters in the book point out a new trend in Timor-Leste today in some institutions promoting modernity as a, as a target of social change. They are themselves explicitly resorting to culture to reach their objectives, be it promoting the state judicial system, gender equality, economic empowerment, land registration, education, or even the formation of the state. We are perhaps at a, at a post abyssal moment in Timor-Leste in which the divergence between what has been labeled on one hand as local, traditional, cultura or rural dwellers practices and on the other hand as global, modern, urban and civilized are no longer in a strict oppo opposition. Many states and daily based institutions now rely on this duality to extend their modern driving governance projects. I turn now for my third point uh, entitled Performing Modernities. One proposed across the book that performing modernities is how global and local modernities have been made in Timor Leste. All of this entails bringing to life and making use of institutions, technologies, and ways of acting and perceiving the self and the world classified as modern, as well as the moral, moral narratives which value them over those considered local. In such process, in Timor-Leste and elsewhere, although in diverse intensities, Proposals of uh, rationalization overlap grow, growing individualism, urbanization, which in turn intersect with prospects of uh, secularization, aspiration of material improvement, etc. Many of the chapters in this book cast like cast light on the technologies and pedagogies whereby such modernities have been enacted, taught, learned spread in some performed in Timor-Leste. Now, my last point is a ve very short one and is about to continue it and change it in the making of development. Different chapters in the book demonstrate how change and continuity co co coexist in a dialectical interplay in Timor-Leste. To finish, I would like to present to you a summary of, the, of some issues addressed by each chapter in the book. So uh, the book is made out of eight chapters plus an afterword and an introduction. Each of them address issues related to an array of diverse phenomena as the first chapter by Alexandre Fernandes. For example, how schools serve to provoke changes in people's social, so, socialization and aspirations and to produce local power institutions at once and the same time. The um, landscape in which uh, Alexandre works um, uh, happened was in was Oekusi. Now the second chapter by Henrique Rocha 
uh, addresses how programs for enhancing people access to state ju uh, justice system ending up in reinforcing local forms of conflict resolution. The third chapter by Miguel Antonio Filho addresses how the rupture of uh, key relations functions as a condition for carrying out in pedagogies used for assisting women survivors of domestic violence. The work is based on uh, observation of um, uh, folk pairs practices in Dili. Uh, the fourth chapter uh, addresses pedagogic practices for turning local artifacts into commodities to restrain strengthening the market economy in Timor-Leste and the role of religion adherence in, in this plot. The chapter uh, is uh, authored by um, Ana Carolina Oliveira and, 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 uh, and I. Uh, the fifth uh, chapter um, uh, addresses the anti-modern marketing strategies and uh, use it in Dili in the making of uh, fair trade. Um, uh, it is, the chapter is write, written by Andresa uh, Ferreira, Lucivania uh, Gozaves, and, uh, and I. Uh, the next chapter, um, writing by uh, Carlos Oviedo Spina, uh, uh, discuss the interplay between local or, uh, and high-tech technologies in the making of land registration procedures in Hermera. Uh, when I talk here about local technologies, I'm referring to fetch money um, relations. Um, the next chapter by Renata Nogueira da Silva address the new social life of ancestors and umaluliki in the making of modernity in Timor-Leste. And finally, the last chapter by Alberto Fidalgo Castro discuss the mobilization of, um, of local institutions to make women's rights respected in a domestic environment. So, uh, this is my presentation. Once again, I'd like to thanks a lot uh, for the opportunity um, to share with you the book. And, uh, and I'd like to say that the book is available for free at the page of um, uh, Brazilian uh, Anthropological Association, which is the editorial house of the book as well. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Kelly. And we can see the day rising in Brasilia behind you as it, as it gets yes. lighter and lighter. And we can hear <laughs> the, the beautiful birds and everything else that's going on accompanying yeah. your morning. So um, good morning to, to you there Thank you. Brasilia. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation and for taking us through the book. It's uh, absolutely fascinating. I've only read the, the introduction chapter so far, but I look forward to catching up with the rest of of the volume and congratulations to you and all the authors as well. And for those of you who are following this, uh, this presentation, you can uh, access the links to each of the books which we've put on the online platform. So you can click on the link and be taken to the publisher's website and so on to be able to access the book. So uh, Kelly's uh, edited volume and Lisa's book uh, are available, I think, for free downloads. And Peter Jobs is also available as an ebook. So please, everybody, ask your uh, university libraries to get a copy or buy a book yourself and maybe buy the ebook because, um, as we've heard through this symposium, uh, postal services haven't been all that reliable with COVID. So um, get it as quickly as you can, probably in an electronic form. Um, but I um, want to now give the floor to our colleagues from TLSAPT to um, uh, launch the conference proceedings from last year from the conference uh, East Timor and the World uh, that took place online in September 2020. So I'd like to now give the floor to Hui and the colleagues from TLSAPT. Uh, I'll invite you to run it the way you want to. Um, I know there is many of the editors online here. So over to you. Thanks very much.
Está agora? Sim. Sim. Ok. So, good morning and <clears throat> forget my sleepwalking. Ah, I think I am now able to <clears throat> present you the <clears throat> collection of books that is coming out of last year's TLSA PT conference. What you can see <clears throat> in the image, I hope, is the general <clears throat> cover in principle we'll have a, a little card box in which to place the, the full collection and it will look mostly like what you are seeing here what we have done in the publication of these proceedings is first of all to keep the structure of the conference by sticking to the panels uh, either individually considered, like in volumes two to five, or as part of a larger whole in volume one. Uh, usually, <clears throat> what TLSA has, has, has done is to <clears throat> public, organize papers by language, and uh, within each language, there is no divisions. We did a different form of organizing these. We asked panel conveners to edit their share of papers, including writing a brief introduction to those papers. In the case, the paper, the, the, the panels were small, <clears throat> three, four, five. Um, we did organize a collective volume, which was too large to be one, one book and so there are two books in portuguese we say it's a volume with two tomos uh, i don't know the, the expression how, how do you how do you uh, use an english expression to to render this but anyway uh, volume one has got actually two two books we decided to publish papers in Portuguese and English. There was not, uh, there were no <clears throat> papers proposed in Tetum, but we made a bold decision to provide translation into three languages, Tetum, Portuguese, and English, for all the abstracts and all the introductions to the sections or the volumes. <clears throat> this took a long time, and uh, we have to mobilize professional translators, but in the end, every single chapter, every single contribution uh, has got an abstract in all three languages, so <clears throat> it, it is uh, available, in, it will be available in Timor um, for our Timorese friends in Tetum as well as Portuguese and English. So this is these are the basic choices that we we made. Volume one has got the title of the conference: Timor Leste, the Island and the World. Uh, and in in the cover. We have the names of the conveners of panels that are present in this in this in this book: Alexandre Conda Silveira, Darlinda Moreira, Estevam Cabral, Erika Pinheiro, Marilyn Martin Jones, Pedro Damião Henrique, Samuel Penteado Urban, Ivana Narciso. <clears throat> so this is the the first one, as you can see. Uh, it has got the contributions of five different panels. So <clears throat> there are more than 20 papers in, in this volume. Uh, we also have a transcript of the address made by José Ramos Horta, <clears throat> the, the guest lecture by Joana Ruas, and the interview which was conducted with Luís Cardoso by our colleague Teresa Souza de Almeida. So this is the first volume. The second volume 
uh, again has got what were smaller uh, panels, panels with small number of papers who, who, who would not justify a volume of itself. And we have Susanna Kelly Silva, Susanna Matos Viegas, Akihisha Matsuno, and Silvia Garcia Nogueira. It's four, four uh, panels which come into this second book of volume one. <clears throat> volume two was edited by Zelia, Anna Looney, Michael, David Webster and myself. It's two panels brought together, uh, all about the national liberation struggle of Timor-Leste. This one I can show you has got a Portuguese and English. Uh, this, this, this one is in Portuguese and English. Uh, it has got an introduction plus 17 <coughs> papers. Uh, the list of papers is here. If you want to see it, I will show you again later on. Volume three. <coughs> was organized by Kewa Poema Vicente Paulino and Lucio Souza. <clears throat> it is um, the proceedings of their panel, which in turn is inscribed into a research project they are carrying out on ethnographic studies of Huicinati in Timor. Rui, sorry to interrupt Rui, could, could you? possibly make uh, the slides to slideshow uh, format so we can see the text a little better, if that's possible, please. Thank All right, you. Let, me see if, let me see if I can, if I can. Cá em baixo, tens uma pequena tela, cá em baixo, ao lado desses quadradozinhos onde está selecionado, tens aí quatro quadrados, ao lado tens uma pequenina tela. Não, mais para o lado, ou para o outro, para o outro. Ou, vai no sentido contrário, ou é aqui, exatamente. Aqui? Está? Uh -huh. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Ok, so this, the, this volume, all the papers are in Portuguese. Again, they have abstracts in three languages. There is an, an introduction and eight papers, all dealing with this fascinating man that was Rui Sinati. As you know, for us, for some of us at least, uh, we have research projects going on. And uh, the, the idea of having isolated as a single volume with uh, a good number of papers is that this will count as an output of the project and it is important for our publish or perish strategy um, and considerations. So volume three on Huicinati, Lucio, Kiel, and Vicente Paulino. Volume four is organized by Susanna Barnes. Land tenure in Timor-Leste between resilient custom and the resurgent state. Again, this time all the papers are in English. Introduction and abstracts in three languages. <clears throat> this was one of the liveliest debates in TLSA, so I presume it will be uh, a volume eagerly expected by a lot of people because this was really uh, one of the liveliest um, and most uh, vibrating panels of the whole uh, conference. And finally, the last uh, volume in the collection organized, edited by Vanessa, Marisa, and David Webster. 
uh, remembering the past, building the future, new ways of seeing Timor Leste. Uh, they have been working for long on these themes. What you can see here um, <clears throat> is that th these papers in Portuguese and English, the introduction, and they have 14 chapters uh, to this to this volume. Uh, this is the, the table of contents, the first, the first six, and then plus eight. Um, okay, so with the, the richest, the, the wealth of the, the contributions to the to the conference, we thought this was the best way to organize. Um, in general, what we will be offering is the package. We will we'll be offering the, the seven, actually it will be seven books in a, in a, in a box set. Although you will be able to acquire to buy uh, of course everybody here uh, in this conference has been to our conference and and is a contributor to the volume and of course contributors will get a free uh, a free copy but um, we have divided we have produced individual books but um, the overall picture is that uh, about 90% of the people <clears throat> who presented papers um, were selected for the publication. There, were, there was at least one panel which did not uh, want to be included in the series. That was the, the panel organized by Paul Castro Seixas and Nuno Canas Mendes. They, they had other things in mind for their work. This was peer reviewed and some people and some papers unfortunately did not meet the basic criteria to be included. So we have, I think, kept the best practices that TLSA has in, in its experience as publishing, as publishers of procedures, proceedings. And um, we have also brought in some new uh, ways of presenting. I'm sure you will like the book. It is currently um, <clears throat> with the printers. It will be out by the end of the year. Um, we are running now <clears throat> into some problems. The, there is a shortage of paper and prices are rising. You know, the COVID crisis is not only <clears throat> putting us uh, in lockdown, it, it means that a lot of economic activity has been uh, reduced and uh, are now facing difficulties. And we are now in this process of waiting for the printers to have access to what they need to print our books. But hopefully by the end of the year, we will have these books uh, already as a physical, as a physical <coughs> good. Okay, uh, if you want to see any of the slides, just tell me and I'll move back. But that was what I had to, to, to show, if any of, the co-editors want to add anything. Um, please go ahead before we leave the floor to Vanessa again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rui, for an introduction and a very rapid uh, run through the volumes. Uh, much appreciated to see the breadth of the research that you managed to bring together with um, the conference uh, last year. And I echo uh, the congratulatory remarks here that uh, Michael has just posted. Congratulations to all the writers and the editors. And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful conference. So 
well done everybody involved. So um, before we go to Q&A or we can fold it into q and I'd like to see whether the other editors and conference organizers have something to add. If not, we can, we can just move to the Q&A and then feel free to uh, chime in uh, if something comes to mind, uh, our colleagues from TLSAPT. Uh, okay, so do we have questions and answers to our uh, questions and answers? Hopefully we'll have answers. Um, do we have questions and comments to our book authors and our editors? Michael, please go ahead. Yes, I just have one quick one for Hrui and the team. How many papers in total are in these proceedings from 2020? I um, see the seven volumes, but I didn't get a sense of the total number of papers. Well, I should I should know the total number of papers, but I, I think it's in the region of 90. Wow, that's very impressive. Thank you. I think it's about 19. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael and Hui. Um, Kelly, please, you've got your hand up. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Lisa. Uh, Lisa, could you share with us how was your experience about writing a book for a wider audience than um, is is not just for so the book is not just for social scientists is is it has another another feature uh, how was it your experience about that how you um how did you get inspiration to do that why to do that could you share something like about it yeah sure and thanks for the question kelly I guess it's something that I've always been thinking about, you know, I, as you know, I've written several academic books or at one monograph about Timor Leste on water politics and spiritual ecology. Um, and it's a very, I guess, I'm a very proud of that book and a lot of years and years of research went into it, but it's an inaccessible book really for, for people who aren't academics. And um, I really, I wanted to be able to write something that would resonate with um, everyday people, like thinking just in the first instance, say of my, my own family and friends and, uh, and non-academics, uh, my Tim Marie's family as well, as those are books written in English. So um, it's the, Eng the English speaking uh, parts of my Tim Marie's family. I wanted to write a book for them. Um, it's not an easy transition to move from academic writing to um, writing for a general audience, but um, now that I've made the transition, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to go back. It's, it's very rewarding. Um, lots of, I had a fantastic editor who worked with me to um, write, to learn how to write in this different style, to um, evoke uh, the narrative in particular ways, in ways that we might not do in academic writing. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pleased and proud, proud of the outcome and, and I hope that it reaches a wide audience. I'm really pleased with the publisher, ANU Press. Actually, I did try to publish it with commercial presses, you know, like some Australian commercial presses, um, because I thought that's the best way to, to reach a general audience. And um, in the end, they thought they probably couldn't sell enough of the books to warrant them publishing it. So I went uh, with ANU Press and it's just wonderful because they put it online downloadable for free so it can reach the, an audience in Timor-Leste. Uh, it also reaches an academic audience, but uh, with, you know, various um, coverage in media and I've, and I've published a number of kind of edited extracts from the book. Hopefully um, it's reaching a wider audience uh, outside of academia and outside of Timor-Leste studies uh, as well. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm, um, it's been a great thing to do. Hmm. We have a question from the CNC and we also have a couple of questions in the chat as well. Please, uh, our authors, if you could have a look in there too. Okay, a question from the CNC, please. Go ahead. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. I think you are muted. 
Yes, it, it was muted. <laughs> Hi, hi, Lisa. Um, my name's Marion. Hi, hi, Kelly. Um, but I have a question for Lisa. Um, the bee ha harvest. I'm fa fascinated in it. What the name of the movie was the, um, about the bee ha harvest? I'd like to watch it. I've had some bees move into a cupboard in my lounge room at home, and um, yeah, it's been great. So I'd like to find out more about it. Yeah, hi, um, and thank you for that. The, the, the film is called Wild, Wild Honey, uh, Caring for Bees in a Divided Land. And I'll put um, the link in the chat where you can view it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thank you, Marion from the CNC. Thanks very much. Uh, so we had a question uh, about the availability of the proceedings. How do we get copies of these conference proceedings, uh, Rui? Yes, yes. How do, do we get? Uh, that's still a hanging question because normally for those of you who live in Portugal, it will be very easy, we'll handle copies. Those of you who come to TLSA uh, conferences, there will be a copy for you at the, the next TLSA conference, which we can really organize not online. Um, we still have to work out how, how to make authors receive their, their, their copies um, in, in these time of our lives in which we cannot travel. It's still not very easy. Uh, even now it, it is harder to, to put things on, on the mail. Uh, it's so <clears throat> still unclear. The, the, the honest answer is still unclear how uh, authors will get their copies, but they will certainly get their copies and we'll <clears throat> try to organize with TLSA with Michael uh, <clears throat> to see how, because we also have, uh, we will be printing uh, more than the number of participants, of course. Um, we want to distribute it for free in, in Timor, but um, how we are going to organize that is still a hanging question. I'm sorry, I don't have uh, any, any uh, better answer at the moment. Sorry about that. Can I add something? <clears throat> uh, of, course the, yes. of course, that the TLSA proceedings are always available then online at, at the website. So I think uh, it's, uh, after printing, there will be a moment where people will have access to the online version next year, probably early next year, I think. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So there will be some kind of PDF or something like that that we can download, as is the case with the TLSA proceedings. Is that is that what you're saying? Yep. So yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, because there are some people asking here when I will I have access and so on. So I think also because of the problems of transport worldwide, we need to to consider that. Um, just the, we need to know the date after the publishing house. Um, we need to look into that and then have a date where we don't know yet when, but I think uh, next year, um, early next year, uh, it will be online too, as usual with uh, all the TLSA proceedings. Okay, th thank you very much for that information. Thank you. Any other questions to our authors? Before we wrap up, we've got maybe about another 10 minutes or so. Peter Job, if no one else has. Peter, you're still here? Oh, yes, you are, I see you there. Peter, what's, what's next on your research radar after this, you know, great success with this particular book? 
which fills in a, I've got two copies right next to me, believe it or not, uh, which fills in a big gap. Uh, the Fraser government had been neglected by historiography. Um, what is next for you? What's your next book? Well, my next book is to continue on the research and I'm trying to formulate exactly how I'll do it. I'm, um, I want to cover the remaining years of occupation while I'm focusing on Australian governments, but I think it is time I started to extend it more internationally. I'd like to have a look at some United States archives and that's been studied to a certain extent, but there's a lot of work to do there. Um, uh, the uh, government of Britain, um, now, the Portuguese archives, as I understand, some of them are going to be translated into English. Um, I can understand some of them uh, because they speak Spanish, but not Portuguese. But, um, uh, but basically, my next tranche of research will be looking at the policies of the Hawke, Keating and Howard governments, because they're, uh, those, that period was important as well. Moving on to um, the momentum internationally, of how uh, the Timor issue developed over time, how it was perceived in the world, how uh, different uh, countries um, responded to it. Um, and basically that's it. That's what I would, I'd like to do in the, in the um, reasonable near future. Yesterday, as you most of you know, I did a uh, brief paper, which is perhaps part of the early exploration of this theme, on the Australian government's policy response to the Santa Cruz massacre. But there's a lot more work to do uh, in that regard. I should say that this book took a long time. It was uh, um, to look at this many archives um, takes quite a, a solid uh, number of years. It's not something you can do overnight. Some people have asked me and some uh, why I didn't uh, cover the later period as well. First of all, uh, as I said before, I think this period in itself is very important because that is the height of the catastrophe that was engulfing the Timorese people. The other reason is it simply takes so much time to do this amount of research. So those are my future intentions. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Peter and Mike. Uh, next question we have is from John Waddingham. Please, John. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. Also to Peter. Um, I don't think Peter agrees with this idea, but uh, I think the book is a terrific book and uh, it's one that I would love to see in sort of, I don't know, graphic or simplified form or something like that for, a, you know, that would be suitable, say, for schools or something like that. But anyway, that's something that I have briefly mentioned to Peter and I still think it's worth thinking about. Um, and just along a similar line, um, uh, I'm curious as to whether or not you've had a chance to, I guess, have, have sort of a debate or something like that, you know, say through the Australian International, what is it, Australian Institute for International Affairs or something like that, because I think that would be a pretty interesting forum to, to set up a debate with, say, DFAT type people. Anyway, just curious about that. And just a final observation. Um, uh, the other thing that's a barrier to reading all of those documents is getting access to them in the first place. And uh, Peter certainly knows, and a few of us know, that it can take a very long time between applying to see an Australian government record, even if it's in, you know, in the open period, uh, applying for it and actually get, getting to see it. And uh, that's also uh, a barrier that, uh, that applies for research in this case. That's mostly comment. Sorry, Peter, but uh, yeah. take well, I'd what be you happy can. to just re respond briefly. Oh, look, I'd be very happy to do it in, a, in an animated or a, a, a kind of format. I'm not sure I'm not the person to do that because I don't have that, those kind of skills. Um, in terms of having a debate, I'd be happy to do that with, with anyone. Um, I don't know how to set that up, but if, if uh, I will be meeting with some DFAT people. I should say the problem hasn't, uh, my only critics haven't come from DFAT. They've come from a um, Jakarta-based journalist because I criticised Jakarta-based journalists because they were sycophants to the Sahara regime. 
uh, and he came out with the standard tropes of that period. Um, and I'd like to, uh, those are the, that's the, who I'd lo love to debate. In terms of my future research, I should also add it with the, depending on funding, I've applied for an Australian um, Council of Research research grant, and I've been knocked back in my first try. I'm trying to modify it and try again, but uh, that, that will be one of the uh, factors about how quickly I can get some more research out, whether or not I'm able to uh, do it full time rather than part time. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. Do we have any uh, last questions before we wind up any further comments from anyone? Uh, perhaps I could just ask Rui, first of all, congratulations on the volume. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing it in print. Uh, do you know if the, the other volume of the more recent conference is going to be published as well? I think there was a, a comment about that by Michael Leach in the chat, Peter, that it's still, we'll have, we still have to print up the 2019 TLSA proceedings because of COVID delays. We have e-copies only so far. Would that be correct, Mike? That's right, Vanessa. We, um, the printers were not simply not operating in 2020 and 2021. So that's backlogged as well. So I'm not surprised to see that Rui is you know, and can co are having issues with the 2020 conference with the 2019 Dili conference. We have the proceedings have been online for some time, as you'd know, but we're still, we do intend to print them up. Uh, but that hasn't been possible. Uh, hopefully it will be soon. Okay, uh, wonderful. Okay, so um, I might bring this, uh, this session to a close unless <clears throat> our authors or editors have something burning they'd like to say. I just added a, uh, a message in the chat there about maybe when we're talking about graphic novels and synthesizing quite complex works of academic scholarship that perhaps it might be something that we could partner up with um, our colleagues in Timor-Leste. I know that CABR and CNC have in the past uh, done graphic novels and done outreach to schools and so on. It might be something um, that we can also ask uh, our colleagues at the CNC about maybe doing something along those lines with them um, making available these academic uh, scholarship works um, more readily. Okay, well, um, we uh, have four panels uh, to follow this session, but uh, first I need to bring this session to a close and I'd like to congratulate uh, and thank all our authors and editors for joining us today. We really do appreciate your time very much. And some of you have had to deal with very early starts and all kinds of, of awkward time issues. So um, we really do appreciate the time you, you've spent with us today. Uh, please everyone again, get your libraries to order a copy, buy a copy of these works yourself. Probably, as I said, getting an e-copy is the, is the quickest way at the moment. And of course, may I remind you that this has been only a selection of some of the excellent publications that have come out about Timor-Leste recently. And the TLSA regularly emails you notifications on new work, so please do join the email list. Many of you are probably also working on books right now. Uh, we've already mentioned some of the uh, research that people are currently undertaking, and I'm sure we will hear more about these, uh, these books coming up in upcoming TLSA events uh, in, the, in the future. So we look forward to seeing and sharing with you uh, the new works to come on Timor-Leste, which as we all would agree, is a complex and fascinating country. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today. We'll um, close this session now. Thank you.